through uh, the challenges of people coming in this morning and perhaps going home this evening, but so really delighted to see so many of you here. Uh, and of course, especially delighted to welcome today's speaker, Professor John List, who is visiting us from Chicago in the US to give this afternoon's original thinking lecture. So John is a Kenneth C. Griffith Distinguished Service Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago. Now, John's research focuses on combining field experiments with economic theory to deepen our understanding of economic science. In the early 1990s, John pioneered field experiments as a methodology for testing behavioral theories and learning about behavioral principles that are shared across different domains. Sorry, that's all right. I'm coming. Very pleased to have you here. So to obtain data for his field experiments, John made use of several different markets, including charitable fundraising activities, the sports trading bar industry, the ride sharing industry, and the education sector. John has collaborated with several different schools and charities, as well as organizations and businesses, including Uber, Virgin Airlines, Facebook, Google, General Motors, and se several non-for-profit organizations. John's research includes over 200 peer-reviewed journal articles and several published textbooks. Feel free to come across others and basis across it. No worries, that's fine, the northern area. Um, he co-authored the international bestseller, The Y-Axis in 2013, before releasing The Voltage Effect in February of this year. So this afternoon, John will be sharing his key findings from his latest book, the full title of which is The Voltage Effect, How to, How to Make Good Ideas Great and Great Ideas Scale. So I'm going to leave John to talk about the premise of the book. There will be, of course, plenty of time towards the end talk for today's um, uh, session for our usual questions and answers. Those in the room should use the traditional method of putting their hand up if they want to ask the questions. And of course, for our audience online, uh, do please chat, uh, type them into the chat function at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we will try and integrate those into the event. So we're quite skilled at it now, uh, and I'm pulling in both sets of questions. So the discussion and question and answers session today will be facilitated by our colleague, Professor Timothy Davini, who's of course, Professor of International Business here at AMBS. So let's get started uh, and let me hand over to Professor Liz to begin this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that kind invitation. Thank Thanks you. For having me. All right. Well, a few. So thanks everyone for coming out. Um, Timothy, thank you so much for having me. You know I'm a fan of your work, especially in CSR, for, for many years. And uh, it, it's great to be here to talk about my book. So I was actually here in London maybe about a month ago. Bless you. Two minutes, was anyone in that audience when I gave the lecture? Two minutes before I walked to the stage, there was an announcement. That's when the queen died. <laughs> and um, so condolences to everyone. I, um, we just about stopped that talk. It was at London School of Economics, but um, it uh, deeply saddened, of course, the nation and in the world. So um, I'm glad to be back on a, a little bit better occasion, this, this great occasion. So I'm going to talk about the book. And the book, we could stand here all day and talk about it. But my job is I have exactly 30 minutes. So I have till 5.04 to try to give you how we got here, what the book is about and what I hope you can learn from the book, okay? So here's a typical slide that you might say, okay, there's a voltage effect, this is about ideas. Now, I want to start by having us think about scaling. So when we have an idea in the small, or in the Petri dish, how do we typically think about scaling it 
And how do we think about which ideas should scale? Which policies should we scale? And I'm willing to say that still today, it is largely based on art. Okay, so what do I mean? We're in the business school. Move fast and break things. Has anyone heard of that? Yes, that's art. Can you get your uh, that phone, please? That's my wife, you can take it out. Oh. <laughs> answer and tell her that I'm, I'm lecturing right now. No, go ahead. Just answer to say he's lecturing. Hello, uh, your husband's in a lecture. It's cold. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> he does this a lot, right? <laughs> when did she pick up? Yeah. Did she pick up? Yeah, she picked up. Okay, yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is a first, by the way. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, workers come. Are okay, you okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did, did um, uh, other bits of art are things like fake it till you make it. Right now, she's probably going to jail because she faked it so much. Throw spaghetti against the wall, whatever cooks, right? Whatever sticks, cook it. That's all art. It's a gut feeling. That's art. Okay, so I want you to think about my book as trying to add science to scale. So if you take one thing from my lecture, this guy is trying to add science to scaling. Now, you might not like my science, okay? It's an economic science. If you don't like it, that's fine. I urge you to bring your own science because the field of implementation science is super new and there is not a lot of theory or science of scaling, okay? Let's talk about how I got here. I got here because a community called Chicago Heights phoned me one day. Does anyone besides Timothy know about a community called Chicago Heights? Raise your hand if you've heard of Chicago Heights. Okay, three people. Chicago Heights is a community that's about 25 miles straight south of Chicago. Chicago Heights is a community where roughly 95% of households are on federal food stamps. It's a community that the modern economy has left behind. The last time I visited Chicago Heights, this is what the Department of Motor Vehicles looked like. Department of Motor Vehicles, that's where you go to get your license, and that's where you go to renew your license. Okay, so they called me and said, we need your help. As a scientist who is trying to change the world, at this point, the question isn't should I help or not, it's where should we start? So where I started was, I built my own pre-K and this pre-K was for three, four and five year olds. And I had three goals when I built this pre-K. One, I wanted to help Chicago Heights. I wanted to lessen the opportunity gap. Two, I wanted to do scientific research on understanding the education production function at an early age. Three, I wanted to create a curriculum that we could scale to the rest of the world. Okay, not very ambitious, right? So that's where I wanted to start. We started building that pre-K in 2008. And I'm an economist, so I know nothing about hiring teachers, bus drivers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but we got it done. It's three, four and five year olds, and we opened our school in 2010. By the time 2014 rolled around, we were convinced that this is a great program. Kids were entering in September, and by January, they were going from the 30th percentile in both COG and executive function skill assessment to roughly the 60th percentile on average. They were going from the south side of Chicago to the north side of Chicago, six months. Okay, so we're helping kids, check. We were writing a lot of academic papers about it. You can look at the Chicago Heights Early Childhood Center, probably have 30 papers about this. So we're trying to teach the world about education production function at an early age, human capital formation at an early age. That's goal number two, check. 
Now let's get to goal number three. What do you think happened when I went to policymakers telling them about my new curriculum? And let's be clear, I am not selling anything. If you want the curriculum, you can have it. It's a parent academy on top of an all day preschool. It's nine binders that we developed over a four year period using field experiments. I was going to policymakers and telling them you can have this for free. Okay, no strings attached. And it, I, I had a lot of policymakers to talk to. I worked in the federal government for two years. I worked with a lot of state and local governments. So a lot of policymakers talked to me. And my, my message was simple. My past self said, look, I have this great program that I want to scale. I want every kid in the world to have this program. Let's start around Illinois. Or let's start in the Midwest. Let's start in the US. What do you think happens now? What's your guess? Uh, they said, we don't know if we value it, if it's for free. Um, <laughs> some, some kind of some cost fallacy <laughs> argument. Okay. If we didn't pay for it, it must not be any good. Uh, when, and that, that's true ubiquitously, by the way. Yeah. Uh, where's your evidence? I had a lot of evidence. Um, 30 scientific papers that are all peer reviewed. And then it almost certainly didn't scale. Here comes a slap in the face. Professor List looks really good in the Petri dish, but don't expect it to happen at scale. As was mentioned, I started doing field experiments around 1990, early 90s. And they were at baseball card conventions. That's because I could fund my own research. No one did field experiments back then. I couldn't, didn't find any funders for it. I never got that criticism in 25 years. So I said, why don't you think it will scale? And they said, it doesn't have silver bullet. What in the world does that mean, by the way? <laughs> Can you help me? Uh, well, I've experienced the same thing. So. Okay. So I'm the chief economist at Walmart now. Can I go to Walmart and pick up a dozen of these? <laughs> yeah. that? But you got the same line. Okay. So I pushed them further because I just didn't get it. I don't get this. John, all of the experts tell us they have the secret sauce. And then when we choose to pick some of them and scale them, they never work. That caused me to pause. Because at that point, that exchange is super interesting to a scientist. Because there are a lot of conjectures. The thing won't scale. And it's a silver bullet problem in particular. For me, we're interested. So I started thinking about my career and started thinking, why haven't I thought about scaling? Has it, is this new? In the White House, as I mentioned, we always talked about scaling, but I never really, never clicked with me. It worked in New Jersey, does it work in California? That's a kind of scaling. Worked in New York City back in the 70s, does it work in Maine in 2020? That's a kind of scaling. At the time that this was happening, when my dreams were being shattered, I was the chief economist at Uber. And daily, we would have ideas, and they would get shot down because it just doesn't scale. Either on the demand side or supply side, something about it doesn't scale. And then I started reflecting on all the other firms I've been working with. I work with a lot of nonprofits, started working doing nonprofit field experiments in the late 90s. Nonprofits and profits, I started to reflect, looking back at my notes, scaling was in there. So it's sort of ubiquitous, bless you, without me sort of realizing it. And then I started looking at what do we know about scaling? And this is the best piece of evidence I could come up with. So some great stuff, and then a miracle occurs. It scales, and then some great stuff. That's a move fast and break things, right? Fake it till you make it. That's the miracle that occurs. So then I started thinking about where we are as a field of economists or empiricists as social scientists. And our game is kind of an interesting one. Our game is when you generate data, do A, B test, whatever, generate a bunch of data, that's cool. But if you can figure out the mechanism or what is the theory at work, you get extra credit points. 
and you get in a major journal. So interesting question, causal identification mechanism, you're golden. Publish it and go on to your next paper. That's where we really are as a field. In fact, do everything you can to get a big treatment effect. Don't cheat, but do everything you can to get a big treatment effect. And then move on. I started to think, is that the reason why social scientists have had such little impact on the world, empirically? When you think about poverty eradication, we've tried it for years. We've been working on that a long time. We have a lot of field experiments, development economics. We haven't put a dent in it. Climate change, discrimination, inner city schools. I started thinking, are we doing something in the Petri dish that satisfies the economic, academic, social science constraints that we face, but not doing research to change the world at scale? And then I started to think, well, if our initial research program had that in mind, how would it change? It doesn't right now. You don't get tenure based on changing the world in 20 years. You get tenure based on top five publications today. You really don't even get tenure based on citations, pretty much bean counting, and then the sites will come later. That's the world that we've created. I don't want to criticize the person. I'm criticizing the marketplace. Okay. So what did I do? I started writing academic papers on scaling. The first two are very accessible papers. The second one in particular, I went and talked to a lot of medical folks. They started doing experimentation long before we did. You see ESPN thing just oh, off. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> but they have a scaling problem as well. They have a big compliance problem. They have a big representation of sample problem. The modal lecture I give on the book is to the medical community and hospitals and World Bank and those types. So we wrote this paper about, well, what can we learn from them? And then I wrote, of course, a theory paper. It was a game theoretic exercise, which if a lot of you aren't well versed in uh, mathematical economics, don't pick up the middle one. We then did a special issue in an English journal called Behavioral Public Policy, where our economic model was the first paper in the special issue. And then we invited sociologists, implementation scientists, psychologists, statisticians, economists to comment. Why is our model wrong? How can we do better with our model? Bring your own model. We, we have to do this better. And then of course, you know where I started early childhood. So we edited a book that had 20, roughly what, 22 different authors writing on scale up problems in early childhood. We have scale up problems in every area. And then I wrote about a dozen more scientific papers on scaling. Let me stop here. Because all of you are here probably because either you're made to be here or <laughs> you're interested in scaling or you're an academic who wants to, who wants to think about a new area. So if you're interested in scaling, let me ask, has anyone in the room read any of these papers? And if you raise your hand, I'm gonna ask you which one and what I did in it. <laughs> okay, no one has. You read the voltage effect, which is good, but not IER, behavior of public policy, Jeff and AER, right? I like that you have the book though. That's a problem, folks. That's a problem because we write academic papers that roughly two people read. The editor and one of the three referees. <laughs> right? Look, I've been editing journals for a long time, right? Close to 20 years. And I understand a lot of referees aren't reading the papers carefully. So if they're not reading it, you're doing all this. What's going on here? You're really changing the world. So that's why I decided to veer a little bit and take some time off and write a popular book. That book that you just raised, Voltage Effect. And the popular book that I wrote is trying to translate all of that, all of the economies, 
all of the Greek symbols, all of the jargon, and make it so everybody in the room and my parents, grandpa, brother, who are truck drivers, can understand it. We need more translation of the secrets that we have locked up in academic journals. So I translate my own work. Other people can translate other people's work. Right? That's what Gladwell does, really. That's great. But we need more translators. Because we're not changing the world by putting stuff in a parochial language that nobody understands and putting a bunch of math around it. Largely because we don't understand it well enough to take the math away and talk about it intuitively. OK, so that's why I wrote the book. Let's talk about the book. And let's start, first start with this question. Were the policymakers correct? Remember, I, I have mounds and mounds of data now on ideas. Which ideas scale, which ones don't? Testing the theory, et cetera. So I can empirically answer the question. These folks are saying, look, it looks great in a Petri dish. You scale it, not going to look as great. What do you think? Were policymakers correct? A lot of people are nodding this way or this way. So we're about 50-50. They were correct. That's what I call the voltage effect. So you might wonder, what is the voltage effect? I call the voltage effect when the benefit cost profile changes from the Petri dish to the large. And I call it a law because it happens as often as the law of demand or the law of supply. Any engineers in the room? Okay, you're angry. I call this voltage, right? You want me to call it wattage? Okay, so I totally get that, but you guys know nobody would buy a book called The Wattage Effect. So I had to do some artistic creativity. But let me give you guys a little bit of a bone here. The analogy in my mind is you have, when you have higher voltage, that's what allows your ideas to get to more people in more situations. That's, that's how I initially thought about higher voltage. Okay, so policymakers won, John Nunn. What about this Walmart silver bullet thing? You're crunching your nose. Are they right here? They never raised a silver bullet. Could be hard to find it. Then if there never is, and it's a silver bullet problem, we're never going to find anything that scales, right? Mm -hmm. Here's where they were wrong. In fact, dead wrong. I think of Silver Bullet exactly like you did. It has that one great thing, the LeBron James, right? Or Michael Jordan, or Messi. I don't, you probably don't like saying Messi here. Who should I say? Uh, Wayne Rooney, maybe, uh, aging myself. You hate Rooney too? Uh, Beckham, okay. The one great thing. That's not what this is. It's not what this game is. This game is the opposite. It's an Anna Karenina problem. Can somebody help me? What do I mean by Anna Karenina? You put the puzzle piece together, I will give you a voltage effect t-shirt on the spot. Because <laughs> I have two voltage effect t-shirts in my bag and I was gonna give Timothy one and the audience one. <laughs> so you tell me where I'm going with that craziness. Why do I call this an Anna Karenina problem? And it's the exact opposite of Hey, best shot problem. It's a weakest link problem. Okay, what's the first line in Tolstoy's book, Anna Karenina? All happy family has the same reason why they are happy, and all the sad family has distinct or unique reason why they okay. are happy. Great. Okay. That's close enough. <laughs> well, you will get one t shirt, Tim, to get the other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Indulge in me. Here's what Tolstoy says Happy families are all alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I have eight kids. Tolstoy has really a dimensionality problem because there are an infinite number of ways things can go wrong in a family. So he, we don't really learn much from that. Here, scalable ideas are all alike. Each unscalable idea is unscalable in its own way but it will come back every time to one of five vital signs. I don't have a dimensionality problem. Every idea that fails on its merit, I haven't gotten the execution yet. Every idea that fails on its merit, on its DNA, will fail for one or multiple of these vital sign reasons. 
every time. Okay, so that's basically chapters one through five. I go over the vital signs in chapters one through five. So let me go over a few of those right now. The first one we all know about, many governments especially fall prey to scaling a false positive. We all know false positives now from COVID era, right? You take a test, it says positive, there's a 5% chance that it's a false reading. That's how we do it in social science. We try to control the error rate, okay? So that's part of the game here. Part of the inference problem is when we set alpha, our significance level to 5%, we're trying to control the error rate, okay? Another part is human error, which I talk about in chapter one. The manner in which we generate data, evaluate data, and interpret data is wrought with human error that significantly increases the false positive rate. I talk about confirmation bias. I talk about MHT, multiple hypothesis test corrections. I talk about cherry picking here. It's human error. A lot of times humans don't even know that they're doing it. That's the cognitive error part. And then I also talk about human fraud. And this is less rare than we hope. I wrote a paper about this back in 2000, economists cheating. Here I talk about Theranos, right? I talk about Elizabeth Holmes, fake it till you make it. And I also talk about some professors in economics who have been fraudulent with data. It happens. That also leads to false positives. So that gives us an idea. Well, this idea of replication is super important when we're not controlling the error rate at 5%. Because in a true world, we have statistical error. That's 5%. That's alpha. But in the real world, it's probably like 50%. Okay? So I lead off with a story about Nancy Reagan in the D.A.R.E. program. Was anyone part of the D.A.R.E. program? Okay, good. So I left that on the sidelines for today. You can read about that in the book. But I talk about a story of Chrysler. The CEO of Chrysler came to University of Chicago, and he told us about some of his problems. And one of his problems was he wanted us to get his line workers to lose weight for three reasons. One, he thought they were paying way too much in healthcare because of obesity. Two, he said they weren't productive enough because of obesity. And three, he said absenteeism is costing Chrysler $40 million a month. And I said, well, tell me more about that. Thousands of workers come into the bullpen every morning and sit and play cards. And then when people call in sick, they get called from the bullpen and go to the line. But they have to pay all those workers who don't get called until noon. That was a union contract. Okay, so he said, if you can get them to lose weight, we're gonna help on all these dimensions. So what did we do? We did an experiment in one plant and we got great results. We took that back to Tom Lasorda. He was a CEO of Chrysler then. We said, look at these results. He said, let's scale to the other 31 plants immediately. And we said, well, wait, it might be a false positive. He goes, okay, I'll give you six more months, come back with some new results. So we tried it again in that plant, and then we tried it in three new plants as well. Guess what we found then? No result, no result, no result, no result. It's simply a false positive. It would have cost him tens of millions of dollars to do that program across the 31 plants. We went back to the drawing board. A year later, we introduced a weight loss program that did work. And it was all because we tried to replicate before scale. That's false positives. I'm an economist, I understand incentives. So behind door two, well, I only have four minutes left, I'm only on door two. I'm gonna leave question marks. Okay, let's go to door three. Talk about Jamie Oliver in restaurants. A lot of restaurants kill it with one restaurant and then they try to scale. Guess what happens? The ones who fail, they fail because their initial success was because of a unique chef. 
If their initial success was due to ingredients that you can get at scale, it has a shot to scale. You still have to execute. But the moral of that story is unique humans don't scale. Okay, so in chapter three, it's really about horizontal scaling versus vertical scaling. Think about my Chicago Heights early childhood program. It worked in Chicago Heights. Does it work in Dayton, Ohio? Does it work in Atlanta? That's going across input and output markets. That's horizontal scaling. The other way to think about scaling is to say, well, what if instead of just doing one in Chicago, we do a thousand in Chicago, where I'm drawing the same inputs from the same input market. And I have the same output market too. That's vertical scaling. Now, those are all together different questions. And you can think of it like this. At Chicago Heights, I only had to hire 30 good teachers. What if I had to hire 30,000 in Chicago and I realized that a good teacher was compulsory for a good check program, which it is. Can that thing vertically scale? No, because I can't find 30,000 good teachers. Now, the idea is, is academics, you know what we do? We say, let's get the 30 best teachers we can find. The reason why is because we have to have big treatment effects. And that will get us in a big journal. You're doing an efficacy test and then writing it up. And then you forget to tell everyone else it was an efficacy test. That's why we're not solving the world's problems with social science. Now you can say, um, well, what's going on here? Well, in a meta, we're doing A-B tests. That's great. You're using an experiment to generate data. A is a control, B is a treatment, but we are doing the best case scenario in the treatment. That's called an efficacy test. How they've solved that in the medical trials is they've said, well, you have efficacy, but then you have phase one, phase two, phase three. How's that gonna work with check? It cost me $20 million to run check. Think somebody's gonna do phase one, replicate what I'm doing and then add some treatment arms? No, there are huge fixed costs to a lot of social science experiments. So we need to think about scaling from the very first step. Now, my solution is simple. My solution is add option C. And an op what do I want in option C? I want option C to be the realistic situation that you will face at scale. Okay, so what does that mean in check? I need to hire very, very marginal teachers. I can do my efficacy test with A, B, but then hire marginal teachers to be in option C. Now you can think about any idea, whatever the idea is, what are the non-negotiable inputs that you need and are they available at scale? If they're available in the same quality and quantity, no problem. But if they're not, you need to test it using option C to make sure your idea still works with the kinds of inputs you will be facing at scale. That's how you can change the world using social science. What I'm calling this is policy-based evidence. Go to scale, bring it back, and bring back the warts and the constraints that you're going to face at scale and test it. People say, I'm using data to make decisions. Yeah, but it's the wrong data. You need policy-based evidence. That's chapter three. But I do, maybe I wanna talk about this guy for a little bit. Just one more second. Anybody know who that guy is? <laughs> That's more than Spock. That's Commander Spock. <laughs> That's Commander Spock. What was his genetic makeup? Okay. Half Vulcan, okay. half Manchester economist. <laughs> he never gets it wrong. What's that thing next to Commander Spock? Smart thermostat. Smart thermostat. Anybody have one of those in their home? Yeah. Yeah. The government's forcing. Government's forcing. You're going to like this story then. Oh, well, you're going to like this story. My paper, this paper just came out last week. Here's what we did. The engineers promise us 
that if you put a smart thermostat in every home, we are going to take a big chunk out of the climate change problem. That's what they promised us. So we went to California. And in California, we got roughly two or three, 2,500 households. And they all said they wanted a smart thermostat. So we sent half of them a free smart thermostat. And the other half, we said, we're going to send it to you later. And then we watched their energy consumption, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. Guess what we find? How much energy did these California households save because they installed Smarty? Nothing. Zero. A tight zero. Why? The engineer promised us it was going to work. Maybe they didn't provide guidelines. The engineers assumed the end user was, was Commander Spock. Spock. What we found in our data <laughs> was that that guy was the end user. That guy goes in and fiddles with the presets, and he fiddles with the default, and he exactly offsets the savings. I don't want to make too much fun of it because I did the same thing in my home. <laughs> we got the 28 page manual. I got it. I went like this because when you get my age, the people tend to type in smaller letters. Um, and I threw it at the lovely lady who just called and said, honey, I got this. <laughs> and I went in and fiddled and I undid all the presets. You have to understand the situation you're scaling to. That's chapter three. Chapter four, spillovers. Spillovers are ubiquitous. I talk about four kinds of spillovers. All ideas will have a spillover of some sort. I talk about four types of spillovers. One type of spillover, I got a I had a check. In my experiment, if you were a control kid, and if you lived nearby enough treatment kids, it was like you were in treatment yourself. It's a paper called The Social Side of Human Capital Formation. And I can tell you, that the executive function skills transfer through kids and the cognitive skills transfer through parents. Okay, that's one kind of spillover. That idea at scale is gonna have high voltage, right? Very high voltage because of the spillovers. I also talk about a market-wide type of spillover. Any of you remember the delete Uber campaign? Hashtag delete Uber. Back in January of 2017, a taxi cab driver sent a tweet that there's a long story that you can read in the book um, that ended with hashtag delete Uber. And that tweet fundamentally changed ride share in America. Lyft, Uber's main rival, had 5% of market share back then. Overnight, Lyft went from 5% to 30% market share. And they still have 35. I just got done working at Lyft as chief economist for four years. We still have about 35%. So Uber was reeling and the chief economist came to my team. My team was called Ubernomics at Uber. And Travis Kellenick came to my team and said, your job is to get drivers back. When you tell the economist that, what will be his solution or her solution? Hey, um... <laughs> Let's introduce tipping. Back then, tipping was not in the app. Drivers put a little tin can in the back seat. That's how tipping went. Customers didn't like it, drivers didn't like it. So I went door to door to the execs and said, we need to have tipping because the drivers want it. I won that fight. When you win a fight like that in a company like Uber, guess what the booty is? You get to roll out the product yourself. So I did it. In the summer of 2017, we rolled out tipping. And you know me, I did it as a nationwide field experiment. But for our purposes, I want to focus on one thing. In Chicago, roughly June and July, I ran an experiment whereby I took 5% of drivers out and said, you can have tips. The other 95% could not have tips. And then I looked at what happened. Guess what happened? They earned more and they worked more. Check, check. But when we rolled it out to all drivers in October, just three months later, 
All drivers in Chicago can receive tips. What do you think happened then? They all worked more. Drivers came in the market because of tipping. And they worked so much more that they offset entirely the positive wage effect that I had observed in the summer. It went to a new equilibrium whereby drivers worked more, but they drove around with empty cars more often. And you only get paid on Uber if you have somebody in your backseat. The hourly wages are identical pre and post. A paper I wrote with Jeff Woldridge and my team at Uber because of the market-wide spillover. That's another kind of equilibrium. Final sign number five, I, I'm going to rush here now, one more minute, if you would indulge me, Timothy. Vital sign number five, I'm going to put behind closed doors. And quickly, the last half of the book has what I call four chapters that are little behavioral economic secrets. How many of you have taken an Uber, say, in the last several years? Raise your hand. A lot of you. How many of you tip your drivers all the time? Raise your hand. Wow, a lot of you are raising your hand. I can tell you what, you are a special group of people. You know why you're special? Please. Only 1% of people tip on every trip. 1% of people tip on every trip. Guess what's the other side of the coin? Three out of five people never ever tip. I said that right. 60% of people on Uber never ever tip. But guess what happens when I take those three out of five and put them in a yellow cab where they have to settle up at the end of the trip face to face? Cash or credit card. Guess how many of them tip in that case? 95%. Those kinds of incentives scale well. Social image, social pressure, peer effects. So I talk about those. Chapter seven is about thinking on the margin. We all learn that in economics, but we don't apply it in our lives. Chapter eight is about quitting. I argue in chapter eight that we don't quit enough. We don't quit enough because society has taught us that it's repugnant. And we don't quit enough because we neglect the opportunity cost of our time. Okay, if, you want to un if you want me to unpack that economies, I'll do it in the Q&A, okay? Because there's a lot of economies there. But those two factors cause us not to quit enough. And then chapter nine, right before the epilogue, is about really the gender pay gap. I've done work for the last 25 years using field experiments on the gender pay gap and on discrimination, trying to figure out the underpinnings for it, causes and consequences of it. And I talk about how to build a culture, but a lot of it is about equity, diversity, and inclusiveness. And that's what the last chapter is about. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Thanks for giving me a few extra moments. And I will take any questions that, that folks have. The one we sit down. Thanks, John. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, we, we have uh, just a few minutes. Um, and uh, so I'm going to start by asking uh, just, just one really simple question, I guess, maybe in some ways, and then open it up. And in the UK during the COVID, period, uh, we would, you know, we were all pretty bored. We were, we were kind of locked in our houses. Um, and we would, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock in the afternoon, we'd be watching a, you know, a bunch of people at a lectern talking about following the science. Yeah. Okay. And, and my students know this because I've said this, that governments have a different set of agendas. In other words, scaling doesn't matter, right? In some sense, they're not economically rational, they're politically rational, which, and so I tend to make an argument that governments don't follow the science, they pick the scientists to follow. They have made choices about what are politically workable. Um, how do you break yeah. the bias associated with that? Because in the UK, we, we obviously had the nudge unit, the payroll Absolutely. insights unit, believing, you know, all the stuff that the Dick was doing, but they ultimately were not really terribly successful because they didn't have that human component, and not because they weren't rational, they could have been usually rational, but they resisted it. Okay, so let me take on that last point, because I did work for the behavioral insights team as well, and I think <laughs> we did a reasonable job getting people to pay their taxes. Yeah. Uh, but but well, I'll say it's not, it wasn't as successful as what we had hoped. Yeah, I think that's true. So when when I first started writing in this area, 
I started writing down models of political economy. And you start there because fidelity is very important. And the decision calculus of politicians is very important. So all of the entities I've talked about here in the modeling can go to political economy. I then veered toward ideas in part because the idea space generalizes from government to for-profits to non-profits. So everything I talked about here is perfectly generalizable. The political economy thing really isn't. I, I was in government. I've been in local governments. That is a special kind of political economy that is different than the political economy of Uber or, or Lyft or Walmart. But that said, the fidelity problem, the political choice problem, there are a set of models that go after that. And have we solved that? Absolutely not. But I, I do think that we have pushed hard enough to where when it's clear cut, the politicians have a hard time ignoring it. So the problem with economics and social sciences is there's a lot of on this hand, that's, and on that other hand, that. Mm -hmm. That's where we tend to be sort of on weaker ground mm -hmm. because then they can choose what helps their party or what helps their constituency. Mm -hmm. But if you have science like vaccinations work, sure, you did have Trump pushing that fake news and stuff, but in the end, the, the science worked when the scientists were all on the same side. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a partly our problem and then partly political economy problem. Yeah. Let me let me follow up on that because you, you brought up the thing about the smart meters. And yes. you know, going back now probably five, six, seven years, there's a whole series of studies by this guy being uh, in shorts with the Ukraine melanin. But there were also similar studies where um uh on the calorie economy from George yeah. Lowenstein and other right? basically showing that the calorie kind of labels on fast food don't materially make much of a difference in terms of obesity or changing a lot of these behaviors. But these seem to all be scalable. In other words, smart meters started in the US, we have them in the UK, they're going into other countries. Calorie labeling started in, I think, New York initially, went across the US in a whole series of places. Now we've got it in the UK and a number of other countries. How do you stop stupid ideas from scaling up? Because the mimetic hypermorphism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. look, what I would say is I, I'm giving you a checklist. Yeah. I, I have five, checks that you need to make you didn't see two of them right mm -hmm. the second one was understand the, the population that's affected by your product a lot of those early studies they choose a convenience sample and show it works and then it doesn't work or let's say non weird people or non convenience mm -hmm. samples and then the fifth one is the supply side a lot of ideas don't work because of the supply side. It's, there are economies of scale and concept returns of scale. So I think if you simply look at the first five chapters in, a, in my book and, and gave an honest attempt at, is this an idea that can scale? Okay, who can it scale to? The most ideas work for one group, but not another. So how do we need to tweak it to make sure that idea can work for the other? And it's not a one size fits all, but a lot of times those are one size fits all. You scale it, and then the original study did not show you the heterogeneity. Okay, so what would I do? That's what your question was. Yeah. I would run right away a multi site trial. So at Uber, Lyft, or Walmart, or, or when I worked in the White House, I said, We want to start if we get initial signal in a petri dish. My next step is I want to do a multi site trial. And the multi site trial allows me to look at when we're looking at heterogeneity. That, that helps in a multi-site trial. When we're looking at, well, the inputs or the people who deliver the program might be different in the South and the North. That's great, a multi-site trial will help you with that. So I, I'm, I'm putting this together not to slow people down. Uh, I don't think science should slow people down. I think it's to give them the playbook about how to still run fast, but scale the right stuff using science. So I would say right away when you can start with multi-site trials. Now with check, you might say, look, John, check's really hard to um, make sure it's not a false positive. I think there you have to take pieces of check and say which pieces are working. And then you put 
different researchers' pieces together and say, yeah, that's a that's a validation of chess. Mm -hmm. And then you figure out which families it works for mm -hmm. and in which settings it works. And that's that gets you a long way to having more confidence. I think when we add science to scaling, it's going to be harder and harder for policymakers to ignore. In the past, they've said, well, nobody knows if it's going to scale or not, so I'm going to scale my pet project. But if we add science and say, look, it doesn't have these factors, mm -hmm. um, tell us why you're scaling this and spending our money, I think it's harder. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of times what I learned in the White House is it's easier to stop bad ideas than to push good ideas. So I think in part, this can be used to stop bad ideas at the doorstep. And then we need to generate some evidence to see if it's a good idea or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember Austin Rolls would be once used this this quote it says 80% of my job in the conservation yeah. economic environment was pulling weeds, the other one was sowing, the other 20% was sowing. Yeah, sowing. so he's lucky. So I worked in the CEA about 15 years before Austin, and I would say 99% of my job was pulling weeds. weeds. Yeah. yeah. But maybe that's just because of the administrations were different. Yeah. Um, okay, we have about, about 10 minutes left, so I'll open up for uh, any quick questions or any no comments but questions. <laughs> yeah. Just say who you are, by the way. My name is Chen Hao. I'm from China. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Uh, Thanks question, for coming. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out uh, from behavioral science point of view why those uh, seventy-five percent of people who take Google have a cheap but uh, when there is a camp place in one of Google cars, they have a cheap but they in, in terms of uh, when they take yellow cap, uh, you, you mentioned that there are really like 89 percent of people in this world will take. So what difference? Yeah, you make? yeah. Let me first clean up the stats. Um, what I mentioned was one percent of people tip every time, and two. What did I say? Two, three, four, five. Do you remember? Sixty percent. Sixty percent never ever tip. Those are the data. And then when I take that sixty percent out to a yellow cab. 95% of the time they tip. Okay, those are the facts on the ground. Now, your question is a good one. John, why do you think that's the case? Think how tipping is done on Uber. The ride ends, you go into your house or into the restaurant or into your workplace. The driver has to rate you. And not before the driver rates you, can you rate them in tip? Sometimes it happens a day later. Sometimes it happens 10 minutes later, but it always happens when the driver's long gone and you're alone, away from the driver. What's happening in the yellow cab, you're doing it face to face. There's social pressure, there's a social norm. The right thing to do is tip. Um, you don't want to be a donkey, <laughs> etc. You have a social image sometimes. And these kinds of settings, Social norms also peak in many cases, self-image. So you want to kind of display the type of person you want to be. When you take all those and then look at our data, those are the culprits that are happening. And it's really important. A social norm isn't important unless it's done as a public action. That's what it has its real bite. If you're doing it privately, social norms don't matter that much. Uh, the self-image does, but those were the key features of why the behavior was different, and we can leverage that insight when it comes to thinking about our ideas that can scale. So I talk a lot about a peer effects paper in, in that chapter and also in chapter nine, whereby people know their, their peer salaries in the workplace, mm -hmm. and uh, that matters a lot, whether you know your upper or lower people. Thanks for your question. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Let me just take one here and then we'll come, go to it. Uh, there's a question here is how do you avoid scale falling into the trap of scaling too prematurely? Yeah, look, scale before your five vital signs are met. <laughs> uh, that's, it's, it's that simple. Yeah. And, and before people would say, well, how do we know when to run? And everyone would say, just run fast and it will work out, <laughs> right? Move fast and break things, yeah. run fast. I've never seen a fast runner who's running in the wrong direction actually get to where they want to go. We are spending billions and billions of dollars of public resources scaling ideas that are throwing darts. 
in the private equity market, a lot of the private act and and uh, financing people like the book because now they're thinking about it scientifically. Yeah. Before they would always just hire the person. They would say, we probably think the idea is not going to work, but if we're impressed enough by the person, we fund them. Mm -hmm. That's really what a VC or a public uh, equity person, private equity person does. Now they're saying, okay, now we can start thinking about the, the science of this. So I would say, I know when something's scalable and not, let's be clear, I don't think everything needs to scale to take over the world. I talk about this in the conclusion. My, my dad had a one person company. He drove a truck as an entrepreneur and he was super happy and lived a great life. He understood the secret sauce of my dad's success was him. And he realized he couldn't have a fleet because he didn't understand how to run a fleet. So his secret sauce is not scalable. Unique humans don't scale. So he scaled it to him. That, there's nothing wrong with that. What I'm saying is maybe you have three of the five vital signs covered and you're happy with how big your tent is. Scale it. But then you know how much, how much you know, what's the optimal amount of resources to put in. But then you also know if you want a bigger tent, those are probably the two areas where you should try to change. Like if it's extent of market or if it's the supply side. Try to use different inputs that can scale. Yana. So when I'm not being a business school dean, I am a professor of sociology. Very good. Stratification and mobility. So I want to go back to Chicago Heights. Chicago Heights and talk about the social side of human yeah. capital. So I kind of want to know if that project working there without issues of scale. Um, and is there an example of either your project or somewhere else where you think in that field of inequality and, and breaking the cycle of the reproduction of inequality, yeah. where an intervention has worked at scale, because all the problems you've talked about in the US you know, are easily replicated in plenty of examples in the UK. And the challenge is also going back to Timothy's point at the beginning, it's of politicians. Politicians don't go the course, even when we might find the solution. So if we can just you know, that, and, and that's fine. But I want to first of all say, if we don't even know the science of scaling, how could the politicians absolutely, do the right thing? Absolutely. Because that's that's not say this is useless because politicians won't do anything anyway. So we you, don't even know because we don't have science. But let's let's go back to your first question. Politicians. Yeah. Let's go the two, back to your first question. Two, so has that continued to work in Ch in Chicago? Yes. Um, where we tried to scale that to, we tried to scale the Parent Academy to London. But the deal was from the agency who was funding it that we could not incentivize parents with cash. And I told them that a non-negotiable of scaling the Parent Academy, Parent Academy is every two weeks, parents come in and they meet with my teachers. We never teach the student directly, we teach the parents. It works brilliantly all around America, but we have to have an incentive to get the parents to come in. So I told them it's not going to scale because there's going to be a compliance issue. They said, we don't care. We can't break the rule. So we did that study in London. And guess what happened? Parents all show up the first night and then they never show up again. So it has no treatment effect. OK, how about the whole check thing that has scaled across Bangladesh now? So that idea, we're writing this paper right now where that program has worked across the country of Bangladesh. Okay, that's check. Have we been able to scale across America? No, because all the politicians tell us it's not going to scale. Um, I think it will scale horizontally. I don't think it will scale is, is, is vertically. So I would not say we can have 20 of these around Chicago because I don't think I can find 600 good teachers. And I haven't even tested whether it works with the kinds of teachers we're going to have to hire. Because I didn't think about it in the original one. Okay, so that kind of takes on the first one. Now, the human capital, the social side, and trying to, let's say, we want to take care of the opportunity gap that is ubiquitous. Well, we've started as prenatal. The lovely woman who called is a, is a surgeon. She does early childhood. She did zero to three. I do three to five, so we've combined forces. And now we do prenatal and the first real treatment is in the delivery room. And we found that with underserved parents, 
It all starts with beliefs. Those parents do not believe the brain is mutable. They do not believe the trajectory is mutable. So then guess what? They don't invest. And then when they don't invest, their children by the age of two or three are a standard deviation behind the people who are investing. So this is a nature paper that came out last year. We go in and do experiments on beliefs. And that does then follow through. Once we change their beliefs, they invested more and then their kids out comes the distributions of, um, let's say high, low SES were, were pretty close. So I think you need good programs in order to find, and then they need to go to a public school that can work. Let's talk about what happened at Czech. Our kids were killing it when they went to the public schools. The ones who just got randomly put in the public schools, by the third grade, their cognitive scores were the same as control. But the ones that stuck together in a classroom, they were still maintaining a high level of performance all the way now to sophomores and juniors. So I had 100% reversion in all the cognitive, like Perry Preschool and Abbasidarian, when they went to the masses, and then the teacher has to teach like the 25th percentile, but when they stuck together, they held, and the non-cog stuff holds too. So that's what we found so far. Does that help answer yeah. your question? Yeah. 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 I think we, you know, we have to stop here at this time. Um, I'm gonna turn over to Fiona, but join me in thanking you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So an amazing talk, and we are going to have an opportunity um, over drinks in reception to continue the conversation. So I'm sure there are going to be lots more questions uh, that, that people will want to put to John, and assuming they'll be happy to answer them. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you also to the audience uh, online for joining us. Uh, and just to remind you, as you know, we always like to have lots of great events in the school. And next week, we're joining forces with the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales in Manchester to discuss audit and regulatory reform and the implications for the profession with huge amounts of uh, change and, and uh, turbulence going in, on in, the, in the profession of accountancy and, and, as I say, the audit function. So that will be a very interesting talk. But let's uh, offer a round of applause again to John. Thank you.